Um, Sean, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Lanzatech and leads the development and commercialization of their core technology. Since its inception in 2005, Sean has led the company to secure numerous rounds of venture capital, significant commercial and technical partnerships with leading global organizations, and government R&D grants. Sean's leadership has encouraged collaboration between biologists, fermentation specialists, process and design engineers, and business development teams to develop the technology and the company to become a global leader in gas fermentation. He's the author of over 20 public, uh, publications and numerous patents. Um, I think for, we're in for a treat, so Sean is our um, first keynote speaker of the <coughs> afternoon, and then we'll move into the next session. And Sean is going to talk to us about Lanzatech, colon, the future, uh, inventing the future of stuff. Isn't that great? Sure, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, okay. So, uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make it to dinner, so um, so you could claim you're me, uh, <laughs> you to dinner, but then you'll need a big ginger wig. So, <laughs> easy enough to find us a measure. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me along to, to talk about Landstech today, and um, uh, I, I hope this is, this is interesting. So, uh, global warming, we don't really have to talk about that much anymore, we don't have to justify why we're doing things in the context of global warming, everybody gets it, uh, and if they don't, if they don't, then, oh well. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what we know, of course, is that the transport sector in particular uh, the burning of fossil fuels in the transport sector releases a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and that CO2 accumulates and has, is having uh, significant um, environmental, social uh, and economic impacts glo globally. So therefore, there really is a, a driver to, to find ways of producing fuels in particular that release uh, uh, less CO2 into the, into the atmosphere. and. Um, and that, and that, 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 that driver is, is, is global, it's, it's a, a growing driver in that, in that more and more people are coming aware of this. And in many parts of the world, of course, the use of low carbon, some call them bio, fuels are, uh, are, are mandated. So governments are uh, insisting on their use uh, in increasing proportions in the, in the domestic uh, fuel supply. The challenge we have, as I see it, is that... Um, is that climate change is, is in the context of, uh, of fuels, climate change is, is, is one of a number of mega trends that in some ways kind of contradict each other in the context of the technologies that we have available today. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, over the coming 20 years, the, the demand for fuels is going to go up by in the region of 40%. Yeah? So we're going to need more fuel. Um, over that same time period, the number of people on Earth is going to increase by about a billion. So we're going to go from, I think, 7 billion today to 8 billion then. And uh, so more mouths to feed. Uh, and, and yet, the only mature technology we have today for the, for the production of low-carbon transport fuels on a mass scale uses food as the primary input to produce those fuels. So we're talking about corn ethanol uh, in the US, and we're talking about sugar ethanol in Brazil. Both great solutions, but are they going to be solutions that are able to have a significant impact on uh, the supply of sustainable fuels in the context of uh, a global uh, fuel supply uh, uh, and, uh, and, growing, uh, and, and that growing demand? So, the, the, the um, consensus therefore is that we need uh, a new technology. And, uh, sorry that this slide's a bit of a mess, but uh, effectively, we need to find ways of accessing new feedstocks, uh, new resources that, uh, that we can convert with some mythical process into a fuel that emits less CO2 into the atmosphere. And, uh, and that's really kind of the, the point at which Lanzatech came in, the, the point at which we, uh, uh, me and uh, my co-founder sat down and said, right, what, what, what would be ideal in terms of that feedstock? The place to start is the feedstock. The feedstock is, is really the... Um, uh, is, is really at the heart of, uh, of the challenge for, for, for low carbon fuel supply. What do you make this stuff from? And what we did is um, what, uh, what I think all very clever people do, 
uh, is go to the pub, uh, sit down, and have a think about it. <laughs> and so that's what we did, and uh, we had to think about it, and we came up with a list, and our list was a list of the things that would be ideal in terms of what one would make a low carbon fuel from. And uh, it wasn't a list of what it should be, but what, what it should, what should it, how it should be defined. And we were saying it should be available, available today, yeah? not something that we have to plant and, and, uh, and grow up as an industry. It has to be a resource that's available today. It has to be a resource that's abundant, available in very large volumes, because we're talking about making fuels, and uh, those fuels uh, are, are needed in, in massive amounts. They're not Fabergé eggs. Uh, in, it would be ideal if it was point sourced. What does that mean? It would be ideal if you could find it in a single location. Uh, and you weren't therefore burdened by transport costs, as you are often with, with agricultural resources, uh, because they, they represent a significant uh, impact on, on, on overall economics. The ideal uh, if the, this resource was low value. Um, I heard a comment today that people, some people think that fuel's too expensive. I personally think that fuel needs to be really cheap. Uh, I think a lot of people have that view. <laughs> Especially if you don't have a lot of money. Uh, fuel should not be the, the reserve of, of the rich. Fuel should be something that we all have. But that doesn't mean to say that it's okay for the fuel that we use to have such a negative impact on our environment. We should have low impact, low cost fuel, ideally. Um, and it should be non-food because, you know, frankly, people want to eat. Um, and when you put that list together, what you realise that you're talking about uh, are uh, waste resources waste resources from industry, from society, uh, uh, or from, from agriculture. And, and what do all these resources have in common? They all have in common the fact that they either exist today or can be converted into gases, gases that comprise carbon monoxide or blends of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And therefore, in, in our uh, magical um, uh, journey to the pub, we were able to conclude that what we needed was a technology that allowed, allowed us to convert gases into fuels because it was really uh, the, res the fact that we can convert gas, we can use gases or we can generate gases from lots of different resources that fit our, our criteria. So we were biologists and therefore we only really thought about a biological solution because we didn't know anything else. And, uh, and what we knew is that bacteria can do many wonderful things. Uh, bacteria are known to be able to produce lots of different alcohols, organic acids, amino acids, vitamins so on and so forth. But could they use a gas as a substrate? So then the journey, the journey to find uh, uh, an organism that can use a gas as, a, as, the, uh, as the, the input to produce a fuel molecule. And, and here we go, this is, this is where, where we have to expand our mind slightly and, and realize we're going on a, a journey through time. Okay? So here's a history of the Earth. History of the Earth, 4.8-ish uh, billion years, give or take. And uh, just to put it into context, Earth formed at the beginning. Um, dinosaurs come along uh, around 400 million years ago, then promptly disappear around 100 million years ago. We come along around 60 million years ago and have been sort of hanging around making the place a mess ever since. Uh, so that probably didn't happen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but over the course of this period, we have had, we have enjoyed on our Earth, Three uh, atmospheres, an atmosphere in the first instance that was highly reduced, and those uh, listening to uh, this, this talk uh, who have really switched on might be seeing where I'm going with this. Um, then an atmosphere that was rich in carbon dioxide, and now an atmosphere which is rich in uh, oxygen, uh, which we're busily and successfully converting back to the CO2 atmosphere. <laughs> That's what we can do. <laughs> and, but this, this is interesting, the fact that we had a reduced atmosphere at the beginning at a time when life is thought to have begun on Earth. Life is thought, people believe, life is thought to have begun uh, uh, at a time when the Earth's atmosphere was highly reduced. So there was lots of carbon monoxide, there was lots of hydrogen, there was lots of methane um, in our atmosphere. And people think that in the context of the, the abundance of these energy-laden gases uh, within uh, um, hydrothermal vents deep in the oceans, we were able, life began, life began uh, where there was abundance of, of these gases, it was warm, there was lots of metals, lots of uh, uh, interesting uh, chemical reactions can take place, and the first biochemistries emerged in this, in this uh, interesting melting pot. Therefore, gas fermentation is believed to have been 
one of the first biochemistries on Earth. A biochemistry that allowed the, the first living things to, to derive energy from their environment, and that energy came from those gases. Interestingly, of course, these smokers look a lot like some of the industrial facilities that uh, you get around the world. And so what, what this means is these, these organisms are also, the organisms that, that uh, they're able to use gases also tend to be pretty tolerant of things like uh, hydrogen sulfide and, and other things that we tend to regard as, as toxins in, uh, in these flu gases. So that's, a, that's another side benefit. We therefore got in a, an organism that could, that had this biochemistry, this, this ancient biochemistry allowing the use of of gases as the sole source of carbon and energy uh, for fuel production, uh, or for, 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 for the production of anything really. And, uh, and we got it in, we trained this thing up, and uh, uh, got it to grow on very minimal media, got it to grow in the context of the kinds of gases that we wanted to, to, to use. And uh, we now had an organism, this is way back then, that was producing ethanol in large amounts, and a decent amount of a, a, an interesting four-carbon molecule called 2,3-butane-dial, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later. But the point is ethanol. Ethanol was our target, uh, and we were making it from gas. S uh, and so we had the beginnings of a process that potentially has the, had, uh, could produce hundreds of billions of liters of, uh, of fuel a year uh, globally, ethanol fuel, from many different uh, resources. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and that's something that we sought to, to scale up. So indeed, that's what we did. We set about raising some money, um, and uh, we built a laboratory in which we, uh, we, we developed our process, developed the, 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 the biology associated with our process, but also developed the engineering associated with this process in order that that biology could be applied at a, a significant scale to produce impactful levels of fuels from this array of resources that, uh, that, it, that it offers access to. So we've, in our laboratory, we've, we've, we work on, on, a, on, a, on a bench scale with little uh, bioreactors in which we grow the, the, the bacteria up. Those things will never scale, therefore we have to bring engineers in, always challenging biologists, conversations <laughs> with engineers, ask all sorts of questions that uh, uh, you've got to go away and, and Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> but you end up, you end up in, a, in a situation where uh, these people actually start to make friends, and, um, uh, and they're building new bioreactors that allow very insoluble gases like carbon monoxide to be brought into a liquid that, uh, that in which our, our bacteria lives, and, uh, and can eat those gases and produce fuels in an efficient way. We built a pilot plant at Glenbrook Steel Mill in, uh, uh, in New Zealand, uh, and, and at that pilot plant we were able to prove out uh, the efficiency and viability of our process outside the laboratory in an industrial setting using industrial uh, feedstock. Uh, and more, more recently we've built a pre-commercial demonstration facility, 16,000 litres, um, in China and operated that. We did, we did that in 2012 and uh, we have a, a process there that's still operating today. Uh, very exciting and, uh, and, 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 and really, you know, really the next step for us is to commercialise our technology now and that's what we're doing this year. The technology, we started off really with the view that we wanted to, to focus the technology development around steel mill off gases. Lots of reasons for that, Doesn't, I won't go into, into any detail here. But really for me what's exciting about this approach is it really does give access to a broad array of feedstocks. Not just uh, uh, industrial uh, emissions but also reformed methane, uh, that, and there's lots of stranded, stranded natural gas around the world, biogas produced from, from waste sites, the gasification of municipal side waste. Dumping of municipal side waste now in Europe is becoming increasingly hard. Uh, incineration is getting a pretty bad rap. And so what are we going to do with all this waste that we produce as a society? Can we indeed gasify it? Can we recapture the carbon and energy in that uh, resource for, for the production of fuels? Don't want to sound like a but yes, we can. Um, <laughs> and biomass, you know, the, 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 the byproduct of, of, of agriculture, etc., could be used. And indeed, in future, we see an opportunity to use CO2 as the carbon source uh, and, and other forms of, of energy such as hydrogen or potentially even uh, electrons as the energy source for producing fuels. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that later. But moreover, what I think Lanzatech has done has shown that the way we think about the production of fuels uh, can, can be expanded in some way. Traditionally, people thought about biofuels and, and 
my argument, and this is this is a, a little this was a little challenging for me to say at first, but my argument was, what's the point in bio? Why are we talking about bio? What is a biofuel? And a biofuel is a fuel that we hope will release less carbon. And uh, and what we said is, well, yeah, but does it have to be made from biomass? And the answer is actually no. It doesn't have to be made from biomass. You have to produce the 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 the, the, the objective is to reduce carbon. The object objective is not to consume a bunch of biomass. And so we were able to kind of, I guess, carve out a niche in this renewable fuels area, saying we can use industrial gases, it produces low carbon fuels, your boxes are all ticked. And, uh, and, and this is now being widely accepted. We've been very aggressive in terms of protecting our technology. Um, we, 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 we filed uh, uh, over 240 patents in this area. Um, perhaps most excitingly, 70, 70, 77 of those have now been granted. We see an opportunity in the steel industry, uh, and that opportunity is global. And this is where we really started. I mentioned the, the plant we built in China. 50% uh, of, of steel production today is in China. And, uh, and so, obviously, once we had a, a technology that was proven out uh, to some degree at our pilot plant at uh, New Zealand Steel, we were quickly on a plane to Shanghai. And through those trips, we were able to form uh, a, a full joint venture companies, one with Bao Steel, probably the largest steel maker in China, or at least one of them, and, and Shaogun, another extremely large steel maker in China. And through each of these joint ventures, we built, uh, um, we built um, uh, pre-commercial demonstration facilities. This is where I talk about the sustainability. Again, you know, it was really important to us to demonstrate that if you are reusing carbon that's a, that's a waste from an industry, you, you could use that carbon effectively to produce a low carbon fuel that displaced gasoline. Uh, so we approached the RSB, the Round Table for Sustainable Biomaterials, an NGO that certifies fuels in this area and said to them, this is what we can do. And at first they were pretty leery and you know, you, you, guys are, you guys are supporting the steel industry and they're busy poisoning the planet. So all that. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we were able to show, look, you know, think about this differently. Think about this as a global resource that's here now, here today, from which we can produce a low carbon fuel in an efficient way. And, uh, and indeed, they performed an audit on one of our processes and are, are now happy to certify our fuels as, uh, as a low carbon fuel. Very exciting from my perspective. But there's a broader in environmental impact, particularly when using gases that come from the steel industry. You know, um, today, what does the steel uh, industry do with this gas? Effectively, the most value it can really add to the gas is to use it for electricity production. Uh, and, uh, and so they can make electricity, you have to upgrade the gas a little bit, they, they can make electricity from it, use the energy in it uh, in a turbine and, and sell that electricity to the grid. We're saying there's an alternative, it's our process, we can, um, we can convert that, that, uh, that, that, that material into a fuel and that will go into the gasoline pool. We, we emit 33% less CO2 uh, per megajoule of energy recovered than, uh, than electricity production. We also emit, we also allow a reduction in NOx emissions and in particulate emissions, which in developing countries where the steel industry is growing and as a result you're seeing increased levels of smog and pollution is, is a really significant thing. I would argue that, you know, pollution in China is not necessarily solely an environmental issue, it's a human health issue, it's a societal problem. Uh, that, uh, that, that, we, that needs to be addressed. And, and one way of addressing this is to find ways of, uh, of, of reducing it by adding value to the very gases that are causing it. Um, of course, we also offer a way of, of, of making more money from that gas. And, and, and again, I feel it's, it's really important that, that technologies that seek to, uh, to bring benefit do so by obeying the kind of uh, laws of economic gravity. And uh, you've got to be able to add value. And, and I think it's important to be able to add value uh, outside of the context of, 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 of government mandates or government support. So, um, we've also demonstrated our technology with gasified municipal solids waste, or gasification. Gasification is a process by which uh, that material is heated up uh, and, uh, and effectively turned into a gas that comprises carbon dioxide and hydrogen. We can take that gas and convert that gas into a fuel. So literally you're starting with municipal solid waste, the stuff we throw in a landfill, and you end up with a fuel that displaces gasoline. We're producing ethanol, uh, and that's, that's our, our focus in, in the, for our first commercial plants. 
Uh, we're very interested, of course, in selling that directly as a, as a component of, of gasoline. We are also interested in converting that into uh, hydrocarbon-like fuels, such as uh, jet fuel, and we've partnered with groups that are able to offer the conversion of, uh, of ethanol into, uh, uh, into jet, and, and we can do this in an economically viable way on account of the fact that we're producing ethanol uh, that's, that's pretty inexpensive uh, compared to conventional routes. Uh, to do this, we partnered with Boeing uh, and Virgin Atlantic, and I really only put this slide up to show that I met Richard Branson, um, <laughs> BFF. And, <laughs> and uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's it, it, for me that's that's tremendously exciting. There's an industry that can never really escape uh, hydrocarbon fuels in in our lifetime. It's the aviation industry. Uh, I'm not getting on an electrically powered plane. Go for it. <laughs> uh, Chemical, I just want to talk, I realize this is a conference focused very much on energy, but I thought that, that, that a, little, a little kind of insight into the chemical industry and, and, the, and sustainable chemicals is, is, is something that may be of, of relevance here. Um, the, chem the market for low carbon or sustainable, uh, more sustainable chemicals is predicted to reach around $100 billion uh, uh, by, by 2020 globally. Um, and, and why is that? Yeah, that really comes from a, a, dry, a, a pull from the the consumer for uh, these these increasingly sustainable uh, chemicals. This is not as a result of government mandate. This is not as a result of legislation. This is as a result of uh, of consumers saying, "I would rather buy my Coke in a bottle that is more sustainable." And, uh, and indeed, the, the, the Coke plant bottle example is one that's that studied in, uh, in universities around the world. The, the four carbon molecule I mentioned earlier is probably going to be our first chemical product. It's, uh, it's a product that can be converted by catalysis into 1,3-butadiene. 1,3-butadiene has a market of around I don't know, $25 billion a year. And, uh, and we're working with SK, the, the Korean oil firm, to, to develop the catalyst, or perfect the catalyst to convert that butane dial into uh, butadiene. We partnered with Invista, the world's largest supplier of nylon, uh, uh, as, a, as a, an offtake partner for that project. This is a picture about the uh, butadiene market. We've also started to really get serious about understanding our, the biology of, of our process. And, uh, and we understand how gas is taken up, how chemicals are made, how the, 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 the um, uh, butane dial is made, and so on and so forth. And what this has allowed us to do is develop a full genetic system for our organism and such that now we can modify that organism, we can truly engineer that organism to allow the production of a variety of chemicals using the innate ability of this microbe to take uh, gases as the sole source of carbon energy and produce this array of, of, of molecules. So things like propanol. Propanol can be dehydrated to, to propylene, polypropylene, uh, you're now producing plastics from, from flue gas. For me, this is sort of intellectually really exciting because it means that now we can talk about carbon capture and utilization. Sequestration of carbon in everyday materials. Not burying carbon in the ground and pretending it never existed, but actually using it in our everyday life, monetizing carbon. And I think that's, that's a, a direction which, which we will see uh, to use CO2 as a carbon source and uh, molecules like hydrogen as an energy source to, to, to lock CO2 into both fuels and, and chemicals. That's something that we're engaged in right now uh, through, through various partnerships. We Fundamentally, we see that there's a whole variety of ways uh, to produce energy, but liquid fuels and, uh, uh, and petrochemicals have to contain carbon. Um, and so, or, or hydrocarbon fuels have to contain carbon, and so why don't we start using, fi fixing the use of our, our, our available carbon around these, these interesting molecules in a way that uh, releases less carbon uh, into the atmosphere. Ultimately, uh, what I think Lanzatech has developed is a technology uh, that offers um, uh, a benefit to, to industry. Uh, it offers a benefit to society in that uh, it improves the, the energy security of a, of a local region uh, and uh, an environmental benefit in that it improves overall efficiency uh, with which we use our, our carbon resources uh, by allowing residues to be, to be used to displace, uh, for example, gasoline, whilst leaving land resources uh, alone to produce few, few, food for um, growing populations. And with that, I'll say thank you.
question. <coughs> Janet. Thank you. That's an absolutely fascinating talk and a wonderful example of the, of the kind of step change I think that we were talking about as being needed earlier in the day. Um, I've got a question though about, about the scalability of, of this. So most of the examples you were showing us were at industrial type scales, but is it, is it equally cost effective as a mechanism if it's at a smaller scale, for example at a farm scale or a community scale? No, I wouldn't say that a farm scale, uh, I would say that would be challenging. I mean, there are real, there are real cost advantages with going to, to large scale. However, I do see at a community scale, and by community I mean, you know, if we take uh, municipal solid waste in it, as an example, uh, we're very interested in, um, in, in applying our technology to, to, to the conversion of uh, aggregated municipal solid waste, and, and I see that as a community scale uh, solution. Other questions? I have one for you, Sean. Sure. Uh, you, you're looking at, um, at, at AVGAS as a, as a possible route for, uh, for, the, for the fuels. Uh, it seems to me as a market. As a market, market. yeah. Uh, that's a challenge when it would be much easier, surely, just to dump it all in road vehicles and not have any of the risks of, um, you've got with aviation. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it, it's, it's a challenge to, to some degree. I mean, uh, but, but then, you know, I think part of this conference is, is really showing that, the, the, that directionally we're moving away from the use of hydrocarbons in, in, in sort of domestic transport vehicles. So, uh, yet the, the market for Avgas is, is still growing uh, and is one that's going to be there for, for uh, generations to come, I would argue. Uh, so, so, strategically as a company, we think it's uh, the right way to go. Um, uh, and I would also... Yeah, I, I also think that this is, you know, this is we're, we're down the track in terms of the certification of our fuel, so, so that's something that we've already addressed. Uh, so, so and, and there's a real pull from the industry to, to, to bring in uh, sustainable fuels into, into, the, into the supply there. They're certainly more motivated in the road sector, aren't they? Um, they are, they're highly motivated. Uh, I, I mean, I think people are motivated throughout. I mean, what's, what's interesting to me is, is the different sort of sources of motivation here. You look at the chemical industry, I think that's a really, it's, it's a very powerful example of how consumers have motivated an industry to become interested in sustainability. Now, that hasn't really, I would argue, happened in the transport sector in terms of fuels. And why is that? Uh, is it simply that people uh, are almost blind to what goes in their tank, uh, but, but, but what that Coke bottle is made of is, 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 is really important to them? And I don't, I don't know why that is, and I think that's a, a job for our... Uh, uh, communicators of science, perhaps. See. Thanks, John. That's incredible. Um, I'm so glad that biologists, which I am one as well, can actually do some really awesome stuff as well. Um, it's very sure, I'm <laughs> This is like one of the few examples where I'm actually almost convinced that this could be silver bullet technology, which is something that I don't normally believe in. But do you see any barriers to uptake? Or any problems? I mean, you are fighting the fossil fuel industry in a way here as no, well. I, I don't see that. I, I mean, people people often make that point that we're fighting an industry. I don't see we're fighting any industry. I mean, um, I think what we're we're offering is is a, a route. I mean, look, when, when we when we first started Landstech, we, we would go around and say, "Come on, in, 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 invest in our company." What other chance have you got to invest in a, in a company that has access to a, a market that's valued at three trillion dollars? Yeah, and, and really, what we're saying is that. There is no market risk for us. The market is just so vast, and the players in it recognise that um, recognise that that market that market is going to be populated by different fuels as we go forward. And I think that's that's something that is pretty well uh, accepted. I think uh, that the risk in terms of uptake for us uh, are not there from a, a, a legislative perspective. The, the barriers that aren't, aren't there from that perspective. The risks are technical risks. And uh, we as a company have to, have to work diligently to try and overcome technical uh, barriers that are in front of us. So we don't have a market risk. I don't think we have an uptake risk uh, to, to any great extent. We have a technical and economic risk. And, we, and we've got to address both. Well, yeah, well it's a follow-on question, really. Thanks. Uh, it's great technology and it's great New Zealand and, and all of that high profile. So well done on all of that. Uh, in terms of the risks, uh, this is a very naive question. You're working with these microbes. I mean, what's the risk 
I don't know what happens to them in the plant, but they are obviously dying and evolving and breeding. And what happens to the dead ones? And and is there, is, is, there <laughs> and is there a risk that the live ones will genetically evolve and and be hit by a virus or, or I mean, yeah, and give up? So that's that's what you mean by managing the technology, is it? Okay. Um... There was a question there, I'm sure. I'm just, uh, <laughs> the, the, the microbes, could they be hit by a virus? Uh, the microbes are Clostridia. Historically, phage infection has, pl has plagued Clostridia, uh, but not our Clostridia. So far, touching wood, uh, we haven't experienced any kind of phage contamination uh, at all. Um, the good news about doing gas fermentation is you, you're not doing... <laughs> you're not doing sugar fermentation. The, the good news is that the carbon and energy source, the only source of carbon and energy in our fermenter, is a toxic flammable gas. And, uh, and so the number of things that can actually grow on that are pretty small. And so contamination is, is, is a, 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 almost a, a vanishingly small worry when compared to a fermentation operating, operating with sugars, uh, which is, you know, is, is a, a fertile ground for any kinds of contamination. In terms of the, the organisms themselves, they, the, there's very little genetic drift dur during a, a fermentation. Um, and, uh, but, but as I say, what I'm really excited by is then moving these organisms on, modifying them to, to become more efficient fuel producers uh, and, and indeed more valuable chemical producers. Uh, and that's where, that's where this is going. One last question, anybody? Yes, today. Thanks for the great presentation. Just a question for you. The, the ethanol that your process produces, is that ready to go or is there a sort of refining process still required post your technology? No, ready to go. You, you put this thing through, you, just got, you, got, you distill it out of, or you recover it from uh, the broth, distillation works, uh, and then you dehydrate it, and at that point you blend it with gasoline, and, uh, and locally, depending on the, the specifications, uh, there's, there's blend limits. Uh, around the blending of that ethanol in, ga in gasoline. I think domestically here in New Zealand that's 10%, uh, in parts of the US it's 15%, in parts of Brazil it's 25%. Sean, thank you very much indeed. Thanks.